Welcome to Trucker Hacks, where we explore the practicalities of trucking and life. My name is Matthew Garnett. This is episode one of Trucker Hacks. The hack of the week this week is securing a simple shingle load, but there's more to trucking than just securement, driving, that sort of thing. We also have to look after our lives, so we want to look for other things we could be doing in the truck, like listening to podcasts, audiobooks. So this week, the podcast of the week is Jocko Willink's podcast. The book of the week is a book by Thomas Sowell that we're going to explore in a section of uh, the broadcast here called the Matthew Garnett School of Truck Driving and Philosophy. But before we get to all that, let's listen to the song the, the next time you see a big semi roaring down the highway, remember the man at the wheel has a great heritage in America. Like the Pony Express rider, the stagecoach driver, and the wagon master of old. No matter what the weather, no matter where the road, he's a man that delivers the goods. And whatever you eat tonight, whatever you wear, wherever you sleep, remember it's very likely that it was a trucker that brought you your food, clothes, and your bed. Well, my ocean is four lanes wide. My waves are mountain high. I sail a 20-ton schooner with the will of do or die. And my cargo must go through to the port that waits for me. I live on luck for a drive a truck. I'm a sailor on a concrete sea. So here's to the unsung hero, though he don't make history. From coast to coast, let's drink a toast the sailor on a concrete sea, the sailor on a concrete sea. Take it easy, truckers. My wife Jen sent me this audio of Johnny Cash singing this impromptu song before a live audience. I wasn't aware of it. But the other day, I delivered some goods to a Menards. And if you live in the Midwest, you know what a Menards is. It's a hardware store like a Lowe's or a Home Depot. And the last time I was at this Menards was to deliver materials so they could construct the Menards. Actually, it made me feel pretty good. I rolled up to the uh, the security guard, and he said, "Have you been here before?" And I said, "Yes." But the last time I was here, my rig was sitting in the middle of your showroom floor. <laughs> Because I was, I was delivering some simple rebar so they could lay the foundation of this particular Menards. But uh, but that's part of the pride of trucking. I, I don't know if you guys feel that or not. Hopefully you do, that, that you're actually contributing to what makes this country go round. It's not the politicians or the pundits or anybody else. It's it's us guys out there, just like Johnny Cash saying, it's, you know, it's us sailors of the concrete sea. Maybe that's sappy or whatever, but some of that stuff gets me through the day. And that's what I want to do with the song of the week for trucker hacks is, uh, is give you some songs that might get you through the day. And maybe you think that's sappy or stupid or sentimental or whatever. That's fine. If that's the case, you don't need songs to get you through the day. You're, you're, you're too hard for that sort of thing. That's okay. But songs get me through the day sometimes, and that's what I want to do is just expose you to some songs that get me through the day, and this is definitely one of them. So let's start with a simple shingle load here. Nothing too complicated, but it can get complicated and frustrating if uh, you don't do a couple of things that I had to learn the hard way, which was, first of all, get your winches set up right. Especially on trailers where you've got winches on either side of the trailer. There's, you've got a limited number of winches. I don't know if your company or your trailer has limited number of winches. You may have plenty of winches. You don't have to worry about this. But for my company, these trailers, there's limited number of winches on each side of the trailer. you got to figure out 
where you're gonna put those winches so you don't have to end up using a bunch of portables, which I hate. I hate using portables. I don't know about you, but I, I don't like it. So anyway, <clears throat> trying to get that set up at this point and uh, you know, driving flatbed trucks is uh, all about walking around, right? We probably wanna limit that to some degree, but, uh, but we get our exercise in. We certainly don't have to have a gym membership with this job. Don't see how some of these uh, these bigger boys do this work, you know. <laughs> see some of these cats roll out of their trucks, and it's kind of like, how are you doing this work at that size? So at any rate, so here we go. So I've got the winches set up, grabbing the straps. I usually carry about five straps per. Otherwise, I end up doing a big juggling act, dropping straps everywhere, and it just turns into a fiasco. So I've got about five straps. I'm going to start lining these out on the trailer chucking them twisting them i'm putting that twist in there you notice i'm twisting the label toward the the rig and i'm securing the hooks on the rub rail not underneath the trailer now you it's perfectly fine you can do that if your trailer's equipped to to put those hooks through the rub rail underneath the trailer but there's a potential they could slide probably won't happen 99.9% .9 of the time won't happen, but if you put the strap through the rub rail and hook it on the rub rail, there's no chance that's, that strap's going to slide. And on a, on a load like shingles, you're not going to be cranking those down where your, your, uh, your straps are completely rock solid. I mean, you can't crank that load down like that. You, your shingles are soft. You got to just get it snug. So there's a chance of slippage with that. So the safest bet, just put your hook through the rub rail and, uh, and, and hook it that way. So, uh, so at any rate, like, you know, like I was saying, we should be staying in, in pretty, pretty good shape doing, uh, doing this, this kind of work. Especially if, if you're like me, I, I mean, when I first, when I, when I came out of the dry van, started running flatbeds, um, I was going. I don't know, 220, 230, something like that. And then the first month, I lost like 40, 50 pounds because I'm running regional flatbed where, you know, you know, us guys that, that run regional and we're not over the road, we're, we're picking up and dropping off every day. So we're securing and unsecuring a, a load a day. And that's, that's a lot of work, especially if you're tarping, that sort of thing. Um, you're gonna stay in pretty should stay in pretty good shape doing that I'll, I would only suggest you might go out and try to jog a little bit maybe because my uh, my cardio is awful I get winded <laughs> I get winded a lot so at any rate so you see now a couple things that are going on here um, I, I'm twisting those labels toward the rig I want this I want this load to, to uh, look nice and uniform I call it getting my feng shui on I want this I want this load to look picture perfect that's what i'm going for doesn't always happen i know and you can spend too much time on that don't you know it's kind of a balance but at the same time if you can learn how to make these loads look uniform and perfect every time it's it's not a problem you know i spend 30 35 minutes per load on these shingles maybe some of you guys oh i, I can do a shingle load in 10 minutes well okay but you can't you can't make it look like this um and and make it as safe as as what i'm doing here now a couple of things here normally so i'm starting to secure these straps into the winches um what i do is i fold those straps over stick them through the rub rail hammer them down with my fist to make them flat so i can fit them through the winch then i fold them up and then i'm then i'm placing that that excess strap into the the skid also here i just wanted to talk about uh when you're going to put your v boards on uh, some guys will will do what I'm doing and put their put their straps in the winches before they put their V boards on because the wind will blow them off. If it's windy out, you put your V boards up without your straps being secured, <laughs> they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna get blown down. I've I've had that happen. It's not it's not good times. Especially this particular facility is right on Lake Michigan. They can get some really high winds in here. Your straps are blowing everywhere. V boards are blowing everywhere. Just best to secure your straps. And then put your v-boards on that's why i'm doing these couple here to just show you but it is a bigger pain you know if it's nice and calm out i don't 
I don't put the the straps and the winches I first. I just put the V boards out, as I'll show you in a second. I'm just doing these couple to show you that it can be done if need be. But but then you've got to leave your your winches loose enough you can get the V boards up in there. And you got to come back and tighten them up again before you come with your cheater bar and ultimately tighten them down. So so the basic idea is, you know, however you want to do it, it's it, it's easier if it's nice and calm out. If it's not if the wind's not blowing. Just to put your V boards up before you even start putting your winches uh, or putting your straps in the winches. So that's what we're doing here. Also, um, I mean, a couple of things with with doing loads this way. I mean, a lot of you guys are gonna be like, "Oh, why don't you just keep your straps on the winches?" Well, a couple of reasons. I mean, if you're if you're an owner operator or lease purchase guy, you know, you you have to buy your own equipment. Why why are you gonna leave your straps on the winches where they're gonna be out in the weather all the time? It's, you're just gonna you're gonna end up buying a lot more straps. What's you know what's what's the point of that? And plus that you know when you leave your winches when you leave your straps on the winches and you're tossing them over, it's much more difficult to put the uh, put the twists in those to to uh, to keep them from uh, from being a, a loose securement because you guys have seen it. You see these guys go down the road all the time with with shingle loads. You got these vibrating straps. I mean the the, the straps are completely completely loose uh, if a state he wants to he's going to pull you over and he's going to cite you for uh for, uh, for a, a loose strap okay a, a loose securement that's illegal so you put those twists in there because especially on shingle loads like this you can't crank those down so hard that you know when your strap is flat and even, even still i mean i've got these these big heavy duty thick straps they don't tend to vibrate as much, but you got those little, you know, buttery yellow ones. They're they're going to vibrate no matter how hard you crank them down, and you can't crank those straps down that hard on these shingles. Everybody knows that. So put the twist in them. Um, and, and and you can't put the twist in them. Um, when or you can, but it's much more difficult to get those twists on both sides when you're when you're working from the winches. That's been my experience. All right. So now another thing here with how these shingles are stacked. Notice that there's one lying like this and there's another one lying on that pallet like that. We've got to get this one secured. That's why we're using these these longer V boards to secure both of those uh, both of those packages of uh, of shingles as you see there. Okay? Otherwise, we're going to have to put two straps per uh, you know, per skid of of shingles and that's just that's overkill. We don't want to do that. So we're going to put that long V-board on there to make sure that that happens. We don't have to worry about those shingles slipping off there. God forbid we get in a wreck or have to turn hard or something like that. So anyway, so here, you know, here I am putting these on. See, you saw I struggled with those a little bit, those, those ones I secured already. And by the way, um, I personally can't carry those long V-boards and put them up with one hand. Maybe some of you guys can. I can't. So I just leave them sitting there, put a few down. Pick them up, take them to the end, and go from there. So, however, however that ends up working for you most efficiently. I've left a couple of V boards there because we're going to put a cross on the front of these shingles to make it officially official that we've secured this load. It's going to look good. You see how the, the those twisted straps facing toward the tractor? They already look pretty cool. I like that. Nice and uniform. Got my feng shui going on there. It's a beautiful thing. And again, this takes a little bit more walking, but that's all right. We need to walk out there. We can get our exercise in. Lord knows we're eating enough carbs and junk and uh, stuff we're not supposed to be eating. We need to work that stuff off so we don't become diabetics and that sort of thing. So we're getting pretty close to the end here. Got the V-boards up. Now, I've got a couple of spare V-boards there. What am I going to do with those? Put them back where I found them? Nope. We're just going to throw those up on up on the load as extra. Oh, by the way, see this cat right here? See how he, he's he got those ones sticking out like this? He Nothing's touching those. those. That is unsecured freight. And he's got flat straps. I mean, he runs into the wrong state. He, he's going to have a field day with that guy. Does I'm, I'm I know it doesn't happen often, but you see these guys pulled over, and you're like, I wonder why that guy that guy got pulled over. Well, 
That could be the reason. I don't want to find out. So I'm just going to do stuff in a way that's not uh, that's not going to get me in that situation. Because while this while some guy may be able to secure a load of shingles in 10 or 15 minutes, if he ends up getting pulled over, hey, you know, I just beat him on time for sure. Because I'm passing him by, even though I took 30, 35 minutes to secure my load, and he's pulled over by, by uh, Smokey Bear because he doesn't have his load right. Plus that, it's just a matter of personal pride. You know, I want these loads right. I don't like going down the road with a, with a half-ass looking chintzy setup. So I'm gonna, I'm, you know, I'm gonna do these loads right every time. And if it takes a little extra time, so be it. So again, we're putting those, we're, we're folding those straps up under each other, going through the rub rail, smashing them down, sticking them in the winch, folding them up, sticking them, sticking the excess into the skids and then when we go to crank those down the the strap is going to smash down on itself it's no problem it's no issue no factor and um, you can do it the traditional way where you fold them up and flip them and but 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 my point is is don't don't leave your straps on the winches that's that's not good plus that when you go to go to tighten those if you've got all that excess strap on those winches, what are you actually tightening down? You're not tightening down the strap. You're actually tightening the strap around itself on the winch. That's what's going on there. Now I get it. I get it. You know, it's it's fine. You know, I mean, you guys are like, oh, you're, you know, this is this is overkill. Well, maybe that should be my middle name, Matthew Overkill Garnett. But um, but that's the thing is, I never have to worry about um, a you know, getting cited for, for improperly secured loads. I never have to worry what, worry about whether my loads are going to end up on the highway. Um, you know, so that's, that's important to me. And plus that, again, that, that sense of personal pride with how my loads look, getting my feng shui on is important to me. Um, that's just, that's just part of the job to me. If that's not an issue to you, that's cool. Um, I understand that, and I'm not try, trying to force my way of doing things on you guys. But if but if you like this idea, this way of doing things, this is this is how I do stuff, and uh, and I do it fairly efficiently. Again, you know, some some guy might get 10, 15 minute jump on me, but big deal. 10, 15 minutes, who cares? I mean, it'd be different if this took you know three and four times as long as somebody else, but it doesn't. You get you you get you get this down and it's it, it just turns into it turns into no factor you can you can do it fairly quickly you just, just it's just a matter of that's the thing is what what i found was you know I, i've done the whole thing where i wrap the wrap my straps around the winches and and tried to try to secure shingle loads that way i just find that that you know whichever way you do it is gonna is gonna take you the amount of time it takes you and if you learn how to do it the proper way and you continually repeat that process in the proper way, um, you're, you're going to get proficient at it. You're going to get to the point where you're going to be able to do a load like this that looks good, that's secured legally and properly, um, where no, those smoky bears aren't going to bother you. And you're going to be able to do it in just about the same amount of time as some guy who's got his straps wrapped around the winches and he pulls them out and chucks the hook over which is dangerous in and of itself because you could whack somebody in the head with one of those or whack yourself in the head with them you know um you're gonna find that you're gonna be just as just as fast or almost as fast as they'll get those guys you know um that's 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 just what i figured out so anyway there's my little sermon <laughs> on uh you know uh on on my philosophy of flat betting maybe <laughs> this is this is going to be the matthew garnett school of truck driving and philosophy as you'll see maybe later on in the podcast so um so at any rate we've got we've got stuff secured i'm gonna go grab my cheater bar at this point start cranking these things down again on shingles as everybody knows you don't want to you don't want to go go overkill on these things you got you gotta get them just sug. Now what I'm doing right now is since I since I'm wrapping those straps around the rub rails, I'm making sure that the hooks are, are in place because they can slip up. As you guys know, you probably when you do that, they can slip up through there because these this particular brand of rub rail just is conducive for that. And if the hooks don't hook on the rub rail, you got a problem. 
All right, so I'm just making sure everything's in order here before I start uh, tightening down straps, and that's what that's what we're gonna what we're gonna go to next. And again, like I say, don't don't hammer these things. You don't. I mean, I've never had a claim on shingles, and I've maybe sometimes cranked them down a little bit too hard, but just just get them snug. You don't want to you don't want to overkill these things. And so as you see, when I'm cranking those down, the way I've got that set up, it's it's drawing that that strap down, and it's and it's 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 going to hold that strap in place under underneath underneath that skid with the with the shingles on it. So anyway. Yeah, so right. These guys uh, that these big, these, you guys have seen. Well, maybe you're one of. I don't want to, you know, I'm not trying to fat shame you or whatever. But if you're a big old boy, I don't see how you're doing this work. I mean, but there, I, there's some guy. I mean, some of you guys roll out over the road. You know, you're you're picking up a load, and then you you may not, you you, you may secure and unsecure, you know, two three, four loads a month because you're just getting that kind of mileage in. So you guys need to watch your weight. Don't be unhealthy. It's a, you know, I've heard people talk about that, but you know what I'm talking about? You feel terrible. Maybe you do, maybe you need to do some regional flatbed truck driving where you're picking up a load and dropping off a load. You're securing a load and unsecuring a load every day. That might be good for you. Still, you don't see very many fat flatbed truck drivers. Most of us are skinny, fairly lanky. Like I said, I lost 40 pounds in the first month of my flatbed truck driving career. So it was quite an experience. It's exhausting work. You can expect to be tired Expect to be hungry. Expect to be exhausted sometimes. It's hard. You earn every penny you make in this line of work. And you want to talk about, I mean, you the drive-in drivers out there, yeah, they've, they've got to contend with regulations, but we've got tons more regulations we got to contend with. So not only are we, are we working hard, but we have to think about a lot more law you know, on top of, you know, the normal regulatory stuff that, that we deal with. So, anyway. So, I'm finishing this up. Tightening these straps down. Getting them nice and snug, as you see. You know, my V-boards are kind of pooching out a little bit, but not too much. You, you start getting those V-boards like that, and you're not, now you're smashing the product. You don't really want to do that. That's why they want the V boards on there in the first place. But but you can you can crank those V boards out and, and make them pretty bad. So now I'm going through. I'm just tapping on on those straps, making sure that they're tight and good to go. And we're gonna put the cross on the front. Put a cross on the front of of these shingles. Rarely do you see people do this, but this is something that is required by my company and is a good idea. Just just to act added layer of securement makes the load look nice and professional none of the smoky bears are going to mess with you on this so i put i put that strap there hook and i and again hook it through the rub rail just kind of almost in a pocket kind of parallel to the to, to the bow of the shingles And that's that's gonna put put a nice, uh, really bulkhead type of situation on there because right now we've got that load secured. It's I mean it's a unit. That's really what you're you're going for when you're securing a load. You want to you want to make that you want to take all the pieces of that load and make it a unit. So right now since we've got the straps across that load, it's one unit. And now we're gonna put a, a bulkhead in front of that unit so that that thing's it, there's no way that that can go anywhere. I mean, basically, I mean, you know, again, you're going to think, oh, this is overkill or whatever. Yeah, it is. If you don't get in an accident or you don't have to slam on your brakes or, you know, or whatever. Some somebody, you know, some truck drivers, you know, got his phone out texting and he rear ends you. You know, yeah, that's 
it's it's fine if none of that happens or you have to make a, a sudden lane shift or something like that. The reason we secure these loads are in case we are in an accident, it's not going to compound the situation, generally speaking. Now, granted, under the normal course of circumstances, there are certain kinds of loads that if you don't secure them, you know, they're, <laughs> they're going to fall out on the highway. That's absolutely true. Shingles are not one of those things. You could, you could drive shingles from point A to point B without doing a damn thing to them. And they would stay there probably. But what if you get in an accident? That's that's really why DOT has to secure these loads this way. Now, you saw me um, you saw me uh, set up these winches. This is exactly why. Because I'm putting these crosses on here. I want a winch available in between my two front straps to, to do this cross. And you see I'm setting it up the exact same way I set up my other straps, folding it up, putting it in the in the skid. That the, that the shingles are on. Securing that strap underneath there. Tightening it down. Got my twist even in the in the cross. Okay, checking it. Yep, looks good. Gonna grab my cheater bar, tighten that puppy down. And we should be good to go to the other side. Get that one done. Right, so if I'm in an accident, this load's going nowhere. It's gonna stick right on the trailer, and that's the idea. So anyway, oh, I'm gonna save myself a couple steps here. Remember, I took those V boards off there. Got to tighten that back down. That's a little trucker hack for you if you want. Um, don't if you see something that needs to be done, do it. Don't like, oh, I'll do that in a second. You know, you you do wanna you do wanna prioritize and kind of do stuff in groups and you don't want to get distracted but at the same time you see something like that i mean how many times i mean i guarantee you every one of us has gone down the road and forgot to tighten down this the strap on our tarps we've done it don't tell me you haven't don't tell me you haven't left a cheater bar lying out on the deck one time okay everybody's done this sort of thing um so that's why when you see something like that take care of it right away so you, so you don't lose tarps, because if you lose your tarps, that's going to that's gonna be bad, especially if you're a company driver, then you're going to have to explain why you've lost your tarps. And if you're an owner-operator, now you got to go buy a new tarp. That sucks. You don't want to do that. So anyway, um, so I've got this, I've got this going on. Now, you notice there, I did use the trailer for the crosses. I, I just did. Um, the crosses tend to be a little bit more squirrely, and, the, and on these rub rails, they just... It, you tend to get into a fight with it, so I just I just gave up, and and put the strap through the rub rail, and hooked it underneath the trailer, you know, like it's equipped to do. Normally, I don't like doing it. I like doing it like you see there, um, on the rub rail. But for these crosses, it just turns into a pain in the butt if you do it that way. So I just did that, cranking that down. Got my cross ready to go. Looks good. Yep, there it is. Boom, done deal. Put the cheater bar back right away. We're done with this load. Close the door. And we're out of here. Express, and I'm talking to whoever's listening out there. Like I told my last wife, I says, honey, I never drive faster than I can see. Besides that, it's all in the reflexes. You just listen to the old Pork Chop Express and take his advice on a dark and stormy night, all right? When some wild-eyed eight-foot tall maniac grabs your neck, taps the back of your favorite head up against a barroom wall, and he looks at crooked in the eye, and he asks you if you've paid your dues. Well, you just stare that big sucker right back in the eye, and you remember what old Jack Burton always says at a time like that. Have you paid your dues, Jack? Yes, sir, the check is in the mail. I'm not saying the 
and I've been everywhere and I've done everything. But I do know it's a pretty amazing planet we live on here. The man would have to be some kind of fool to think we're all alone in this universe. This is Jocko Podcast number 219 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. The train station is very busy. Tata says the train cars they are using are called cattle cars, which are usually used to transport animals or dry goods. Every day, more cattle cars arrive and get filled completely as each train leaves I wonder where it is going and hope it is somewhere wonderful when our name is finally called it is our turn to load up on the train we are packed in like preserved pickles in a jar Once the car is filled with 60 to 80 people, they lock the doors. The car has no seats or toilets and no water. There are small openings at the top of the car to provide air, but only those tall enough can see out, and the openings do not provide enough ventilation. I am not tall enough to see out, so I have no idea where we are or where we are headed. It is colder than usual this April and hard to stay warm, even packed together like sardines. The train does not stop for any reason, so we ride and ride for a few days, standing all the while. Mama, Aunt Lee, and Tata try to comfort us children. Even though I feel overwhelmed, I try not to cry or complain. I want to show Mama and Tata that I am big girl now. A group of men read their Bibles and quietly recite prayers. The cars get stinky because of the poor ventilation and no toilets. I don't understand why we are treated this way. The looks of panic on the faces of the adults and the cries of the younger children unsettle me. At long last, the train finally slows down and comes to a stop. The door is unlocked and a man in a blue and white uniform climbs into our cattle car and tells us we are in Auschwitz, Poland. He says here, with the help of the Red Cross, we find out that mom and Cecilia went to Stutthof. Stutthof. Stutthof, a camp in East Prussia. Mm -hmm. That concentration camp reportedly expanded several times, adding more barracks and extermination chambers during the war. They tell us that Rachella Rachella, Rachella and Cecilia Schindler, Schindler were killed there. Just before liberation, all surviving inmates were loaded onto barges, pushed out into the Baltic Sea, and were deliberately sunk. Right. Our worst fear is realized we worried about mom and Cecilia's safety every day. We were suffering in the camps, keeping hope alive that they would survive. Learning with certainty that they are dead is a tremendous blow. The Red Cross is also investigated the Red Cross also investigated our family in Poland that went into the ghetto. They tell us that our cousins, aunts, uncles, and grandma Schweid saying that right, Schweid? Schweid. Schweid were all killed. None of them survived. We also find out that our dear grandpa Schindler refused to go into a ghetto when the Jews were rounded up in 1942. He was shot in the street near his home. Right. At 90 years old, he refused to leave his home. We now know that our whole family is gone, murdered by the German Nazis. 
Dad is dead. Mom and Cecilia are gone. Our extended family no longer exists. It is just Fred and me in the world. All that remains from our former life is the gold chain that Dad wore to hold his watch. Not an easy book to read. No, it's not. I've read it so many times, and yet every time I, I break out in tears. I can't help it. I mean, bo- both both to 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 hear and read about both of your family and Max's family, the entire families. Gone. Wiped out. For no reason, just because they were Jewish. The world doesn't realize what they've lost. Who knows? Maybe one of those people could have been a doctor who would have found a cure for cancer. Okay? Because we believe a lot of them in education. Okay? So we had that funny little opening video of the Matthew Garnett School of Truck Driving and Philosophy. And as truckers, we have the luxury of educating ourselves about religion, philosophy, and the like. I suggest we take that opportunity. That's a that's a trucker hack, that par excellence, the, the ultimate ability for us to sharpen our minds steal our souls and that's that's what I do when I'm out there and that's what I think we have to do and the Jocko Willink podcast is indispensable to that end in understanding who we are as human beings and I'm a Christian I'm a Lutheran Christian, and I'm not ashamed to say that, because I think that that articulation of religion has the sharpest focus on what is real. And I wanted I wanted to expose you guys to Jocko Willink's podcast through this Auschwitz survivor because what Holy Scripture teaches us is that God dwells with those who suffer. This is Jocko Podcast number 219 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. The train station is very busy. Tata says the train cars they are using are called cattle cars, which are usually used to transport animals or dry goods. Every day, more cattle cars arrive and get filled completely. As each train leaves, I wonder where it is going and hope it is somewhere wonderful. When our name is finally called, it is our turn to load up on the train. We are packed in like preserved pickles in a jar. Once the car is filled with 60 to 80 people, they lock the doors. The car has no seats or toilets and no water. There are small openings at the top of the car to provide air, but only those tall enough can see out, and the openings do not provide enough ventilation. I am not tall enough to see out, so I have no idea where we are or where we are headed. It is colder than usual this April and hard to stay warm, even packed together like sardines. 
The train does not stop for any reason, so we ride and ride for a few days, standing all the while. Mama, Aunt Lee, and Tata try to comfort us children. Even though I feel overwhelmed, I try not to cry or complain. I want to show Mama and Tata that I am big girl now. A group of men read their Bibles and quietly recite prayers. The cars get stinky because of the poor ventilation and no toilets. I don't understand why we are treated this way. The looks of panic on the faces of the adults and the cries of the younger children unsettle me. At long last, the train finally slows down and comes to a stop. The door is unlocked and a man in a blue and white uniform climbs into our cattle car and tells us we are in Auschwitz, Poland. For instance, God tells us in Exodus 39 through Moses, starting in verse 38, this, now this is what you shall offer on the altar, two lambs a year, day by day, regularly. One lamb you shall offer in the morning and then the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. And with the first lamb, a tenth measure of fine flour mingled with a fourth of a hen of beaten oil and a fourth of a hen of wine for a drink offering. The other lamb you shall offer at twilight and you shall offer it with a grain offering and its drink offering as in the morning for a pleasing aroma, a food offering to the Lord. It shall be a regular burnt offering throughout the year, throughout your generations at the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet you there, to speak with you there. There I will meet you with the people of Israel, and it shall be sanctified by my glory. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priests. I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God, whom brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. So the point of this is, and, and as we listen to this Holocaust survivor talk about how she endured ordeals, she knew that the Lord dwelled with her. And we, I as a Christian... And I think all, this is also true in Judaism, but I think it's, it's more pronounced in Christianity to say that we know that God suffers. We we believe that Jesus Christ is God, and if and if and if Jesus Christ is God and He was crucified by the Roman government and suffered that horrible death, and not even that, just think about the fact that He was. God Almighty of the universe, and he shrunk himself down into the vir- into the womb of a virgin when and was born into this fallen world. Yeah, that's kind of the God suffers, and what servant, what disciple is above his master? What student is above his teacher? That's the idea. So, our God dwells with us, as we see from Moses in the book of Exodus. And not only does he dwell with us, he suffers with us. And so um, that's that's what kept these Holocaust survivors going. And um, that is what is the inspiration from the Holy Gospel for me. That not only does God suffer with us, you know, I'm out there, my arms are tired, they feel like jello. You know, my the, the God I believe in suffers with me. In that, in this fallen world where we have to make our bread by the sweat of our brow, according to the curses of Genesis, it's just how it is. That's that's this life, but he suffers with me. And so, um, knowing that, and knowing these stories of how God has given strength to those who have suffered, is inspirational, and and it makes you want to. Makes you want to go out there and be, be better, 
do more, try harder, overcome. And that's really what I want to show here. He says here, with the help of the Red Cross, we find out that mom and Cecilia went to Stutthof. Stutthof. Stutthof, a camp in East Prussia. Mm -hmm. That concentration camp reportedly expanded several times, adding more barracks and extermination chambers during the war. They tell us that Rachella, Rochella, Rochella yeah, yeah. and Cecilia Schindler, Schindler were killed there. Just before liberation, all surviving inmates were loaded onto barges, pushed out into the Baltic Sea, and were deliberately sunk. Right. Our worst fear is realized. We worried about mom and Cecilia's safety every day. We were suffering in the camps, keeping hope alive that they would survive. Learning with certainty that they are dead is a tremendous blow. The Red Cross is also investigated. The Red Cross also investigated our family in Poland that went into the ghetto. They tell us that our cousins, aunts, uncles, and grandma Schweid, saying that right, Schweid? Schweid. Schweid were all killed. None of them survived. We also find out that our dear grandpa Schindler refused to go into a ghetto when the Jews were rounded up in 1942. He was shot in the street near his home. Right. At 90 years old, he refused to leave his home. We now know that our whole family is gone murdered by the German Nazis. Dad is dead. Mom and Cecilia are gone. Our extended family no longer exists. It is just Fred and me in the world. All that remains from our former life is the gold chain that Dad wore to hold his watch. Not an easy book to read. No, it's not. I've read it so many times, and yet every time I, I break out in tears. I can't help it. I mean, bo both both to 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 hear and read about both of your family and Max's family, the entire families gone wiped out for no reason just because they were jewish the world doesn't realize what they've lost who knows maybe one of those people could have been a doctor who would have found a cure for cancer okay because we believe a lot of them in education okay Not much to say after that, is there? I mean, we can think of ourselves compared to this Auschwitz survivor and gain strength. And I think that's what she wants to do for a lot of people. Is say, you can continue on. You can make it. But also to say that God is the God that dwells with us. Emmanuel, God with us, is what she's trying to talk about there. And that's a lot of what got her through that. And I, as a Christian, know that God suffers with me when my arms hurt because I've had to tarp a bunch of loads. It's petty, I know, compared to this. But at the same time, um, these these are the people who fight for freedom in really remarkable and historic ways. But I go back to that Johnny Cash ditty that he did. You know, we're heroes too. We are. We get stuff where it needs to go when in the dire in the most dire circumstances if need be we risk our lives uh and risk many things now should we be compared to Auschwitz survivors absolutely not we should not but we should take some some pride in ourselves and 
also know that whenever we're suffering, we haven't suffered as much as this woman has. Not even close. Not even close to suffering as much as, much as this woman has to bring freedom to the world. And... Yeah, so I'm, I'm inspired by this. Obviously, take from it what you will. At a minimum, we need to know what we ourselves mean when we use a word like discrimination, especially since it has conflicting meanings. The broader meaning, an ability to discern differences in the qualities of people and things and choosing accordingly, can be called discrimination one, making fact-based distinctions. The narrower but more commonly used meaning, treating people negatively based on arbitrary assumptions or aversions concerning individuals of a particular race or sex, for example, can be called discrimination too, the kind of discrimination that has led to anti-discrimination laws and policies. Ideally, discrimination one, applied to people, would mean judging each person as an individual, regardless of what group that person is part of. But here, as in other contexts, the ideal is seldom found among human beings in the real world even among people who espouse that ideal. If you are walking at night down a lonely street and see up ahead a shadowy figure in an alley, do you judge that person as an individual, or do you cross the street and pass on the other side? The shadowy figure in the alley could turn out to be a kindly neighbor out walking his dog. But when making such decisions, a mistake on your part could be costly, up to and including costing you your life. Okay, so... Um, we're talking about discrimination here, and this is a big hot topic in our culture right now and Thomas Sowell has uh, been in the forefront of this for for a long time he's one of my my he's probably definitely one of my favorite economists <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that means anything to you people I used to be an economics major and so uh, so to hear economists talk about certain things they talk about it in very uh, straightforward uh, common sense you know, this is just, you know, factually based. This is how things are. If you're walking down the street and you see a shadowy figure, you're more than likely just going to go to the other side of the street. You're not going to judge that individual uh, based, you know, based on his, in, you know, you're not going to go up and go ask him, hey, are you a, a criminal who's going to try to mug me? You're not going to try to discern any more information. You're just going to take the fact that shadowy figures walking down the street on a dark night, um, can be dangerous and you're going to take that bit of information and you're just going to go okay well the cost of finding out whether this individual is in fact one of a friendly neighbor walking his pet or whether he's a he's a criminal look looking to shake me i'm not willing to take that risk the cost is too high that's how economists talk and by the way thomas soul is black all right i just want to put that out there because that's really what he has spent his whole life talking about uh is that is, is this notion of of, of discrimination and, and how this all plays out. So he's trying to sort this out for us. And and it's very helpful uh, to, to see that, you know, okay, that there's not these extremes when it comes to discrimination. You know, you have discriminating tastes, like, you, again, like you like a fine wine, like Sol says here in this passage. Um, or versus, you know, oh, you just you just hate all black people. That's, you know, those those are the two extremes that he's talking about. And what we're trying to do here is, is say, hey, no, no, there's there's a middle road here. There, there's a place where, you know, no, I don't hate all black people, but um, there is there is, in fact, legitimate grounds to judge groups uh, based on their uh, on statistics from those groups. If no other data is available, that's what Soul's getting ready to say. Now, that's controversial. Um, that's difficult. And, and we're going to see why as we go forward with, uh, with, with Soul's book here. I would recommend, again, I'm putting these books out here because you should get them and you should listen to them, truckers. Or, you know, regular people, get them, get the book, read this book. It's very, very helpful. All right. So we're going we're gonna to hear what Soul has to say about this as we, as we move on here. In other contexts, you may in fact judge each person as an individual. But that this depends on context means that people have already been implicitly pre-sorted by the context, and only after that pre-sorting are they then judged as individuals. For example, a professor entering a classroom on the first day of the academic year may judge and treat each student as an individual. But that same professor, walking down a lonely street at night, may not judge and react to each stranger on the road ahead as an individual. 
The students in a college classroom are not likely to be a random sample of the full range of variations found in the general population and are more likely to represent a narrower range of people assembled there for a narrower range of purposes and with a narrower range of individual characteristics, as well as being in a setting less dangerous than a dark street at night. In short, one of the differences between the applicability of discrimination 1 and discrimination 2 is cost, and this is not always a small cost, nor a cost measured solely in money. Everyone might agree that discrimination 1 is preferable, other things being equal, because it means making decisions based on demonstrable realities. Nevertheless, one may still be aware that other things are not always equal, and sometimes other things are very far from being equal. Where there is a difference in costs when choosing between discrimination 1 and discrimination 2, much may depend on how high those costs are, and especially on who pays those costs. People who would never walk through a particular neighborhood at night, or perhaps not even in broad daylight, may nevertheless be indignant at banks that engage in redlining, that is, putting a whole neighborhood off-limits as a place to invest their depositors' money. The observer's own redlining in their choices of where to walk may never be seen by them as a different example of the same principle. In short, discrimination 1 can have prohibitive costs in some situations, especially when it is applied at the individual level. However, discrimination 2, the arbitrary or antipathy-based bias against a group, is not the only other option. Another way of making decisions is by weighing empirical evidence about groups as a whole or about the interactions of different groups with one another. This is still discrimination 1, basing decisions on empirical evidence. But the distinction between the ideal version of discrimination 1, judging each individual as an individual, and making decisions based on empirical evidence about the group to which the individual belongs is a consequential difference. We can call the ideal version, basing decisions on evidence about individuals, discrimination 1A, and the less than ideal version, basing individual decisions on group evidence, discrimination 1B. All right, so this is pretty pretty important point that Sol is making here. So in other words, um, a person who wants to start a business, let's say, you know, a just a deli, a grocery store type of place and they're looking you know they've got their choices of any any place they, they want to put it they can put it right in the middle of an inner city area they can put it in the suburbs they can put it in a rural area that is the same decision as you deciding hey do i walk through this neighborhood where three murders have occurred in the past week or do I walk through this neighborhood where no murders have occurred in the past week? See, that's that's the same decision. And often, what the, the point Soul is trying to make here is often this gets labeled as discri quotes, discrimination too, which is racism. That is to say that um, there's this whole kind of meme going on out there that talks about these food deserts or, or these uh, retail deserts in the inner city, you know, People don't don't want to put their shops in the inner city because why? Well, the narrative is because they're racists. In other words, they are they are making those decisions based on just what soul labels discrimination too. They just have an antipathy for black people or Hispanic people or minorities. They just don't want to put stores in their neighborhoods because they hate those people. That's not the case at all. That's the exact point that Soul is making. They're, they are making a calculated decision, just like any one of those people who would accuse a business owner of not wanting to put a store in a dangerous neighborhood. Just, he's saying, look, you wouldn't want to walk through a dangerous neighborhood. Why would a, why would a business person want to put their store in a dangerous neighborhood? Now, uh, other than, you know, just, hey, these people need a store here. I'm going to put the store here out of out of compassion. But if you're if you're a business person, um, that's that's a risky factor to place in. You know, now you're now you're bordering on philanthropy. You, are you going into business? Or are you going into charity? That's that's the question you you have to start asking yourself. See, um, and so a lot of this a lot of this discrimination that gets blamed on what soul terms as discrimination to this antipathy, this hate for a certain race. Um, really has nothing to do with race and, and it's great analysis anyway i would encourage you to to buy this audiobook truckers listen to it uh, it's going to help you to kind of sort through 
You know, you'll see this on the news all the time. Oh, th you know, this business owner decided to leave this neighborhood, you know, and it's a largely black neighborhood and, and he's a racist. Or, you know, you'll, you'll see that you'll start to see these sorts of things. And uh, Soul just does a really great job of sorting these things out and basically saying, you know what? It really has nothing to do with race in 99% of the cases. It has to do with other mitigating factors. It's more complicated than that. That's why I like economists. That's why I like Thomas Sowell, Glenn Lowry. These guys bring Glenn Lowry in here at some point for sure. But go get this book, Discrimination and Disparities. Uh, check it out. Buy it on audio uh, or Kindle, paperback, whatever your pleasure. All right. So there's our first episode of Trucker Hacks. We've got our Trucker Hacks in for this week. And uh, we'll get you another one next week. We'll see you then. The next time you see a big semi roaring down the highway, remember the man at the wheel has a great heritage in America. Like the Pony Express rider, the stagecoach driver, and the wagon master of old. No matter what the weather, no matter where the road, he's a man that delivers the goods. And whatever you eat tonight, whatever you wear, wherever you sleep, remember it's very likely that it was a trucker that brought you your food, clothes, and your bed. Well, my ocean is four lanes wide. My waves are mountain high. I sail a 20-ton schooner with the will of do or die. And my cargo must go through to the port that waits for me. I live on luck for a driver truck. I'm a sailor on a concrete sea. So here's to the unsung hero, though he don't make history. From coast to coast, let's drink a toast to the sailor on a concrete sea, the sailor on a concrete sea. Take it easy, truckers.